in one of the letters, are we not good? Oh, in one of the letters to the, to the churches in, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says these words to the church. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they will eat with me. In other words, we will share life. That's, that's the meaning there. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's a, there's a famous old picture of Jesus standing at a doorway. And it, it, looks, it looks like, uh, you know, Hansel and Gretel kind of cottage. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. You know, it's got the old wooden plank doors that kind of peek at the top. And Jesus is standing outside that door and knocking. And one of the things you'll notice if you look at that picture is that there is no door handle on the outside of that door. There's nothing for Jesus to reach and grab a hold of and pull it open. All he can do is stand there and knock. The people on the inside have to open the door. And so I know we've been singing, Lord, open my heart. The the reality is maybe what we're saying is give me the courage for me to open my heart because Jesus can't yank open a door with no doorknob. The people on the inside have to open the door. What he does is he stands and knocks. So I'll just tell you, I don't know what you're going through. Some of you, I know your, you know your circumstance. Some of you, I don't know what all you face this week or what's coming up this next week. I just know that if you'll open the door, Jesus will come in. And sometimes that takes a lot of courage. So I just want to pray this morning that we'd have the courage to open the door. He's there. He's knocking. He's saying, I want to help. I want to get involved. I want to be a part of whatever it is you're going through. And I know some of you are going through some pretty tough stuff. Jesus said, let me come in. Let's do life together. Let's do life together. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us the courage to let your son in. That we wouldn't sit on the inside wrapped in our fears and wrapped in our anxieties and wrapped in our arrogance and our pride that says, I got this. And that with humility and with great faith, we would go to the door and let you in, the one who is knocking, the one who wants to come in. So Jesus, I thank you that you love us enough to come and find our little cottage. (laughs) You love us enough to stand outside the door and just knock and knock and knock and knock until we have the faith and the courage to open the door. So God, we just pray that you would give us the faith and the courage to open the door to the one who wants to do life with us. Thank you for your love. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, grab a seat. We want to we want to to have another moment of prayer for some of our friends down south. You guys have been watching the news, right? I mean, collectively, whatever we've got going on in Grants Pass, it's not as bad as having your entire town burnt down. All right? I mean, that's a tough deal. So, did any of you know people in Paradise? Some of you? Yeah. So, we've got you Right? We got firsthand reports. It's just ugly uh, what's happened there. So two things. One, we're going to pray, but I know that some of you want to be able to respond physically and, and monetarily. Our partner in all of these kinds of events that take place is, is called Convoy of Hope. And uh, Carissa told me earlier that, uh, that uh, by this afternoon we'll have a link on our Facebook page. If you can't find it yourself, they, they, they've got a pretty good web presence themselves. But if, if you'd like to be involved in, and send a donation to people that are bringing in food, that are bringing in emergency supplies and medicines and cots and, you know, the stuff, right, that people need. Uh, Convoy's our partner uh, with that. And... Uh, so if you'd like to respond, either look them up directly or, as I said, you can find them on, on our Facebook page. Uh, but I want us to just stop right here and to pray for people. I, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine. I mean, can, can you imagine? I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing, like, if your house burns down but not the neighbors, you can go next door and spend the night and kind of start to clean up your mess, but when there's no place left to go, <laughs> you know, there's no neighbor to go to. I mean, I... It's just, it's just overwhelming to even think about. It. So, Father, we pray for our friends. Some of us are specifically praying for a friend we know. The rest of us are praying for friends we've not met. But we're saying, God, this is a tragedy of incredible proportions. And we're just asking that you would get involved in these people's lives. 
Father, that the people that need help would get it, that organizations like Convoy, and I know there's others, but that, that those people would find ways in and they would find the resources to bring the water and the blankets and the food and the stuff that just has to happen. God, for the people that are trying to fight a fire that is just out of control, I pray that you would give them wisdom about how to do that and that you would give them safety about how to do it so that they don't become a victim of the very thing they're trying to fix. God, we just pray that you would get involved in this situation and that you would help our friends. You would just help them, God. Help them with the despair. Help them with the emotion of this. Help them with the loss of this. Help them with the physical things that are connected to it. And for families who've already lost loved ones, God, for the sorrow of that, we just ask that you would get involved and that you would bless these people with your presence and with your supernatural intervention. Because you're the God who could send water and manna into the wilderness to feed people. You can get food and water to Paradise, California. So we just ask that you would do that. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 St. John's coming. He's coming up here because he's going to collect everybody that's in first through fifth grade. So if you're in first through fifth grade, you need to head this way. St. John's down here. He's got to have, I think, some announcements as well as just saying hello to the kids. So St. John, this is yours. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Turn it. There we go. Good job in the sound media booth. I was going to come up and just start talking like this and say my batteries must be dead in my pack. But uh, I'll do like this. Good morning, family. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Is that true? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. I believe it too. So it's so good to see all of you here. Everyone got up nice and early in there. How many of you had breakfast? Some of you. How many of you are like ready to have lunch right now? <laughs> Then we will get through the day. Just hang in there with us as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our kids here in front of us as well, and uh, we are just so excited. Hi there, Austin, our first through fifth graders. And uh, believe it or not, today they're going to decorate for Christmas over there because we start our Christmas curriculum next week. So we're having a little Christmas decorating. I know, can you believe it? So we have that going on as well. But also our middle schoolers will be staying in service with us today because Pastor Seth is uh, bringing the word to us this morning. So he's got his uh, group with him there as well. It's going to be great, his supporters and, and the, those that just love him endearingly. But let's pray over our kids this morning and get ready to dismiss them, shall we? Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you so much for every young life represented in this room right now. Father, Lord, everybody has a purpose and everybody you have a plan for, I have no doubt. I pray that as you help our leaders today to help these young people to understand and, and fully discover what is the plan God has for their lives and that they would take that journey and they would take steps boldly and faithfully to move towards you always, every day, dying to ourselves and moving towards uh, the cross. We give you praise and we give you glory for this opportunity to minister to children and to minister to this body as well today. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, kids, you guys go over there and get started. I'll be there in just a moment. And while they're doing that, I just have a few announcements for you as well. If you are new with us or you've never filled one out, we have in, in your pews in front of you, we have the called the Connect Cards as well. Now, one of the things I really thought about what's cool with these Connect Cards is every Tuesday we have a staff meeting with the pastors and the office support staff. And one of the things we do is we always go around and have a discussion. Did, did we meet anybody? Were we aware of anything taking place in someone's lives? Is someone going to the hospital? Is someone sick? Does someone need prayer? Because we pray for each and every one of you once a week. One of the ways you can help us do that is by taking the moment to fill out your Connect card. Tell us about something awesome that God answered in your life, because we will celebrate with you as well. But if you are in need of something or anything like that, this is an opportunity for that. Also, if you're with us and you want to make sure that you get onto our mailing list and that we keep you in the loop of information, this is the best way to do it, and then we have you in the system. We promise we don't sell your address and phone number to anybody unless the price is right. No, I didn't say that. Unless the price is right. There you go. That'd be awesome on there as well. I want to let you know that um, we're going to get ready to take our offering this morning as well. And so, I don't know where the offering people are at. Did we do offering already? Oh, they're here. They're here. Come on down forward as we get ready to take our offering. Let's pray real quickly before we begin that, shall we? Father, we give you the, uh, the opportunity uh, to just show you how much we depend on you and how much we realize everything we have comes from you. I love that scripture, you own a cattle on a thousand hills. I used to always get it wrong and said you own a thousand cattle on a hill, but God, I was younger then. 
But I've learned so much as I've learned to be faithful in walking with you. As so many in this, in this uh, uh, gathering here in the worship center have learned, if we are faithful with you in these things. So God, this is our offering back to you just to say, Lord, we thank you and we realize where all of our supplication comes from. Every need that's being met is done by you. So we ask, would you bless this offering in Jesus' name? Amen, amen. All right, and while they're taking that offering, ladies and gentlemen, today's your last day that you can go out into the lobby after church and buy your tickets for the reservation for what's called the Big Dinner. Uh, the Big Dinner stands for Bless and God. It's gonna be at our golf course. It's being hosted um, by our seniors group as well, but it's open to all ages, and we'd love to see a gathering of everybody of all different ages to come and join out in there. Uh, just an opportunity to say we are Bless and God, but it'll be a totally catered uh, time there as well, if you can do that. Also, my other announcement I have as well is, how many of you have heard of Blue Zone? Anybody hear Blue Zone? Yeah, Blue Zone is an initiative that's taking place all around our nation, and Grants Pass is one of them, and we decided it's trying to take place right here in Parkway as well. And it's simply an initiative to try and help you to live a healthier life, make better choices, see the doctor less, unless you go see the doctor for good reasons. There's nothing better than when you go to the doctor and say, hey, doc, guess what? Here's my, here's my uh, thing that's been going on with my scale. Here's some things that have been going on with some of my readouts. Here's the way I've been feeling lately. It's an amazing thing. And, gentlemen, do any of you have a golf addiction? Gentlemen with golf, ladies, let your husband play golf. I saw the other day a man with Parkinson started playing golf, and it said that he was suddenly coming alive again. He went from playing like once a week to where he was hitting five days a week. And uh, his wife said, I'm so thankful that my husband has golf in his life. So imagine that. I think it was God, but we're going to go with the golf as well on there as well. But in the Blue Zone, just to let you know, they are having an awareness meeting. If you are wanting to find out more about Blue Zone and some of the things you can do to help make that healthier lifestyle choices from walking, it's kind of a holistic approach. It's going to be on Tuesday, November 13th at 4 p.m. in our conference center, which is over this way here. So if you'd like to be a part of that as well, we'd sure love to have you there. Now, very last thing. How many of you like good deals? I, how many coupon shoppers? How many of you like free stuff? How many of you like when you go into a store and get something for totally free? That's a win-win, right? You're going to be able to do that today because there are deep, deep discounts and there are free meals to be had for veterans today. Invite them to go with you and say, I'm taking you to lunch. It'll cost you nothing. <laughs> But I would like to take this opportunity, if we could, as a fellowship together, I would like, if you are a veteran, active duty, past service, or retired military, would you please take a moment just to stand up? Do I have anybody representing Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard? There you go. Now, don't sit down till someone says, I'm taking you to lunch. There you go. Listen. We appreciate your service. We appreciate the freedoms we have because of the price you paid. You guys, you ladies, be super blessed this day. Amen? Now, would you welcome Pastor Seth as he brings the word to you today. Welcome, Pastor Seth. Might need that. How's everyone doing? Cool. I'm glad you guys are awake. I gotta fix my stuff. I wasn't prepared as I thought I was. If you don't know me, my name is Seth, and I oversee youth and worship ministry here at Parkway. And um, this will be my 11th year in December. So. So I'm just gonna pray this is mostly for me. I know we've prayed a lot this morning, but this is mostly for me. <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that your word is living and it's active. God, and I thank you that you are not a dead God, but you live inside of us. God, and I pray, Lord, as, as we speak about your word, God, you would penetrate hearts this morning. God, that you would challenge us, that you would, you would convict us, Lord. And, and as your word says, says God, that your, your word is for teaching, uh, rebuking, and, and training in righteousness, Lord. And, and so that we may be fully equipped for every good work. And so, God, I pray as we dive into your word today. God, that you would just, you would train us in your righteousness and you would, you would teach us to be more like you. Would you, you. would you mold us to be in your image, Lord? And we just pray these things in your name. Amen. 
So, we are on a, a series called the Purpose and Value Series of, of Parkway, and um, who's been involved in that so far and in the process of talking? Anyone? Anyone been here for that? I'm speaking to a new crowd. You, you realize we're a hand-raising church, right? Cool. All right. Uh, so we've been on this purpose, uh, Parkway Purpose and Values, and and for those who haven't been here, we started it as a pastoral team, and we just sat down at the beginning of the year, and we said, you know, we, we really want to reach our community. We want to connect people to Christ, and, uh, and we asked ourselves honestly, are we doing anything that's getting in the way of Jesus meeting people? And, um, and so there were some things that we, we decided, you know what, we're doing some things that probably isn't the best. And um, so in here and what we do outside of these walls, um, we decided, you know what, we need to start changing some things. And in the process of change, how many of you guys love change? Change, change is hard. And uh, in the process of change and doing things, uh, it's easy to get sidetracked and lost in the weeds because... Uh, people don't like change. We don't like change. I like change when I'm leading it. Uh, but, but we don't. And it's easy to hear people's opinions and start to redirect ourselves and to lose ourselves in the process. And so we said, you know what? What's the DNA of our church? What, what is what holds us together? And um, in that process, we found that a lot wasn't changing as far as the, the idea of who we are in our DNA, but we said, you know, we're doing a lot of good stuff that isn't God's stuff. And maybe we need to refocus and be more intentional about the stuff that we believe in, even though we, maybe we're not doing it wrong. Maybe we just need to be more intentional and do it better. Does that make sense? And so, so our purpose, our purpose as a church, does anyone know it by heart? You can't look at the screen behind me. <laughs> hey, middle school and high school, if you can memorize this by next week, if you can memorize this by next week, I will buy you a $20 Dutch Bros gift certificate. <laughs> Gail's a middle schooler next week. I will, buy, I will buy a $20 Dutch Bros gift certificate for whoever can memorize that. How about that? It's out of my pocket. <laughs> Can someone give me $20 for next week? <laughs> Things you do out of uh, nerve, nervousness. Our purpose, building a multi-generational, multi-generational Christian community that is Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-inspired, biblically literate, and obedient through the personal relationship with Jesus that changes us so that we can change our world. Why does it matter that we know our purpose? When we know our purpose, we know what our purpose is not. And I know that is super simple. When we know what our purpose is, we know what our purpose is not. And it seems really, really easy in our own lives. We think our purpose in life is, is really easy to figure out, but it's really easy to get sidetracked get sidetracked in watching too much TV, too much sports, doing chores around the house, right? No, probably not. I get distracted. I'm, I'm, when I'm working at home, I'm, I, I'm a busybody, so I have to clean a lot, and my wife loves me for that. Thank you, Jesus. But we get sidetracked in our purpose. Uh, and, and For example, uh, we were in Bend, this last weekend, and people were always asking us where we were from because we were in a big group walking around and we were acting like idiots. Uh, but we would say Grants Pass, and in, in the past it was like, I don't know where Grants Pass is, and it's like, it's only like four hours, three hours south. And, and now that in and outs here, it's like, oh, I know where that is. Oh my, yeah, I, go, I drive three hours to go down there. And in and out is a perfect example of a company that knows what their purpose is. 
They are. They know that they're not some hole-in-the-wall Thai restaurant that has 199 items on the menu. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Their purpose is to get you in. And they're called in and out. What? Oh, my word. They're called in and out, and their purpose is to get you in and out. And so what does that mean for in and out? Well, it means that their lines, you know, when they first opened, they had cones and people all the way up 7th Street, and it, and it changed the way they did their service. Their lines are efficient. Their food is easy to make. Their, their menu is super simple. And when in and out was starting, I don't know if you guys know the story, but when in and out was starting, everyone told them that they were not going to make it as a business. Oh, you're... you're your menu is too simple. I want pickles on my hamburger. Or, you know, people would complain about what they do and don't, and don't have. And they, and they told in and out that people told in and out that they would never be successful as a business. And yet they decided we're going to make good food so that people would drive three hours to get there, get enough food. I had a neighbor. He would literally drive down to Reading like every single weekend to get in and out burger. But it's good enough for people to drive that far to get, to get food, and they get people in and out. They know what their purpose is, and, and their purpose changes what they do. So being a multi-generational Christian community, that's going to change how we do church. It's just going to change what we do. We're not going to be like every other church in our community. We're just not. And so some of the decisions that we, we make as a church are, are going to change this year. So I'll give you a couple examples because you guys are like, we're going to change. And you're like, I'm tired of talking about change. I want to know what we're doing. Is that okay? All right. So one of the things that we're changing this year, you can write it on your calendar. It's in July. We're doing a multi-generational all-church family camp. I know. I'm excited about it. Been talking to the college students. The college students are excited about it. The high schoolers are excited about it. Been talking with Ron. He's excited about it. I know people that are trying to get spots already. So, it's going to be excited. I, I don't know the details. <laughs> Do I look like a detailed person? I always forget. Stewart Park. So uh, we're, we're renting RV spots, and we're, we're renting huge group sites, and we're going to do worship together. We're going to roast s'mores together. I heard there might be people that might be interested in bringing their boat to go jet ski. I haven't asked them personally, but there's a possibility that that might happen. So we'll have events with high schoolers. We'll We'll, we'll do stuff separately with traditions, but we're going to all have times where we're gathering together, we're praying for each other, we're eating together. So that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be dimming the lights here on a Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, I heard it. And here's why. I, I want to explain why we're going to do that, because the, the next time that we do it, you're going to walk in, and you're going to be mad at me because I said it from the pulpit, and that's okay. I'll take the hit. And you're going to be mad because you probably can't find your mint box that's sitting next to you. I, I don't know what the reason's going to be, but I know that when change happens, people get upset. But here, here's the why. Casey did it a couple weeks ago when she was leading worship. She asked the, the guys to dim the lights. And she, and she said that because she really wanted to have an intimate and focus time with Christ. And one of the conversations that we've had about reaching the next generation, we've been talking with some of the students in our church, and a majority of them would say, you know, it would be cool if we could dim the lights. And in our conversations and asking why that's important, well, you go to a movie, what do they do? You go to a play, what do they do? You go to a concert, what do they do? Is it because church is a concert? Why do you think the purpose is? 
Focus, right? Distraction. So when you go into a movie theater, I love movie theaters. We had a long discussion about that this weekend, and I'm going to the movie today to take my kids to see The Grinch. Yay! I hate going to the movie theater. I have this problem with sound and people chewing with their mouth open and opening their bag slowly. My blood is boiling thinking about it. You guys need to pray and fast for me before I go to the movies today. But our, the next generation, and, and it's, yeah, focus, yeah. The next generation, right, you, you watch TV. And when I was in high school, it would be the camera would change the angle every 30 seconds. And then when I was in college, they started changing it to be the camera angle would change every seven seconds. You watch a show now that's probably not Days of Our Lives, but if you watch a show now that's geared towards younger people, guess how many seconds it is? Three seconds. You know why? Because the attention span of our society is changing. And if the camera stays on for 30 seconds, people get bored. And they get distracted, and they start doing other things. And because we've provided that environment as a culture, it's harder for younger people to focus. And it could, I mean, it could be everyone in this room. I don't know. You know, a lot of the reasons people want the, the, the lights up is so that they can see everyone worshiping. When we talk to students, it's, I want it to be intimate. I want it to be personal. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in everyone that's opening popcorn around me. And the things of earth. Right? It's intimate. Right? We want to have an intimate time with Jesus. And so that you might see that happening. We're going to be starting an intergenerational choir. And actually, if you're interested in that, if you can carry a tune... If you can carry a tune and you love worship, I'm going to have pizza for you after lunch down in the conference center. If you're thinking about joining that and you say, hey, I can sing, I love worship, come down to the, the conference center. We're going to do things like a family game night in January in the whole center where we play things like bingo together and we watch movies together and we Watch other people play sports <laughs> together. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll play bingo. We're going to do the big day dinner that, that Ron's doing. He's hosting with his traditions group, and some of the college-age students are coming. We're going to be very, very intentional about building relationships intergenerationally. Why do you ask? Thank you. Thank you for asking, by the way. You know, you've heard it that three out of four students leave their faith after high school, right? We've heard that statistic. Have you guys heard that statistic? Yeah. You know what the number, in, in every research that I have read in any book, in any magazine or anything, you know what the number one reason students stay in their faith? Multiple relationships with older people. I, I am a product of that. I'm a product of, you guys might have known Galen Couch, who passed away a couple years ago. I, I am not the same person because at 2 o'clock in the morning when I was fighting with my parents, and I, and I would call him frustrated, and he said, well, Seth, it's 2 o'clock, I have to get up at 6. <laughs> but he would stop and he would pray for me. And he would give me advice. I'm not the same because Joe Lloyd was my youth pastor and he took me out to coffee every single Wednesday to see how I was doing. I'm not the same as I was because when I was frustrated with my parents, I would go over to Mark's house. Because <laughs> Mark lived right next door and I could say, this is what's going on. He's like, you know, the way that you responded to your mom or your dad probably wasn't Christ-like. 
and he would guide me in that process. And I am who I am because people of other, other generations invested into me. And so we're going to be that as a church. So in the midst of this change, how do we do that? Yes, and I will read from the Bible today for those who are wondering. How do we, how do, we do that as a church? Because I will tell you, as soon as you start making an effort, it's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. And even though you might be 50 years old or 60 years old and you're pretty confident in regular life and you start hanging out with a teenager, you think you know life until you you hang out with teenagers. Trust me, I'm a youth pastor. I can tell you that. I go to schools and I am the most insecure person ever. Because you want to impress them or you want them to like you and you're more, you're more vulnerable and it's easier to get our feelings hurt in that process. And, and younger generation, just because they're older than you, doesn't mean they don't have feelings. They're people. Yeah, I know. And it's easy to get our, our feelings hurt. It's easy to get frustrated with the process of, of watching kids and how they act. And, and so how do we act? How do we respond to each other in those processes? So what are some guidelines of, of how we can live our lives as a church? No matter how hard change might be, we're not going to be a church that lets our emotions dictate how we treat each other. We're not going to let our preferences dictate how we treat each other. We're not going to let our assumptions about each other dictate how we treat each other. In the process, we need to realize that Jesus asked us to love one another. He didn't say people would know, uh, know that we're his disciples by what kind of cough we, we have out in the lobby. He didn't say that. He didn't say whether we turn the lights down, whether we turn them up, or whether we play from the grand piano or the keyboard or we play from the drums or the congas. He didn't say that. He said that they will know that you are my disciples by what? Love for one another. So last week, Dennis talked about five things of, of what, we can, what we can do, practical things of how we can do it. And that's to serve one another. And, and, and basically, he summed up all his points in, there you are. We're going to have a there you are attitude as a church. We're going to be about other people, not about ourselves. The difference between here I am and there you are, what, how does that look like? Well, we'll talk about that. He, he talked about serving one another. He talked about living in harmony with one another. He said not to slander one another, to not grumble against one another, to stop passing judgment on one another. This week, I want to talk about kissing each other. I do. Yep. Awkward. Bible actually tells us to kiss each other. Did you know that? You're like, I need to read my Bible more. Probably do. Middle school boys. This is not an excuse to get all wound up right now. I know you're looking around the church seeing who you can kiss after service. It says, says, greet greet one another with a holy kiss. We obviously don't kiss. I don't like to kiss. I am not a chachi person. (laughs) You might have found that out. And when we were planning the sermon... Dennis and Rick and Andy thought it would be funny to give me the sermon about kissing. So that's why I'm speaking this morning. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was them making fun of me. <laughs> Romans 6, 16, 16 says, greet another with a holy kiss. And, and, and it is actually said uh, four times in the New Testament. Three, Paul says it from from. Romans and Corinthians, and, and Peter says it in chapter 5. 
What is greeting each other with a holy kiss? I am very, very thankful for people that are way smarter than me that uh, talk about context of, of the culture, that talk about what a holy kiss means because I really don't want to kiss you. But I'm, I'm thankful because there's a principle that Paul is trying and, and Peter tries to teach. Back in the culture that Paul was talking to, kisses were appropriate in three ways. Three ways that that kisses were appropriate. One would be close family or family like friends. You would kiss your close family or you would kiss people that that were like family. So you, you hear about Jonathan and David. They kissed because they were close. You hear about... Um, the prodigal son and, and the dad coming to kiss his son. The second one is when someone was going to leave for a long time. We just recently sent three students off to, to Australia. And even though I didn't kiss them, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> even though I didn't kiss them and I'm, and I'm not a, a touchy person, I gave them a hug because they're dear to my heart. I said, I'm not going to see you for years, so I'm going to give you a hug, right? Three is is rituals it'd be kings and sons it'd be a sign of submission what is a holy kiss a holy kiss is something that's that's impure so an an opposite example of that would be judas iscariot when he said rabbi right when he was when he was turning jesus in and he kissed him on on the cheek All, all of the times that it says kiss, kiss one another and greet each other with a holy kiss, it's actually directed to people that were not of the same culture. And all the churches he writes it to are churches that were mixed with Jews and, and non-Jews, Gentiles. And it was improper for Jews to treat Gentiles like they were family. They just didn't associate. It wasn't a cultural thing. And so is it possible that Peter and Paul were saying, treat them like family? Doesn't matter what race you are. Doesn't matter what what ethnic background, whether you're a girl or a guy. No prejudice. You treat them like family. In, in Galatians, I'm trying to find my notes. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave or nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So how do we as a church say welcome to the family? How do we say welcome to the family? You're welcome here. No matter who you are or what background you are, you are welcome in this family. Number two is that we should accept one another. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another just as Christ Jesus accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What does it mean to accept one another? Accepting doesn't mean agreeing with everything that someone does, despite what our culture says. doesn't mean that I have to agree with you. I don't, I don't say, well, Ethan, you, you stole money out of my pocket last week. We just... That's okay. Do you want my wallet? Just hang out with it for a little bit. I welcome you and my family. I welcome you to come up to my room where my wallet is and just have free reign. It's okay. Give them some more. Yeah. It's, it's not accepting what the person's doing and saying, it's okay that if you steal from other people. That's not what accepting is. Acceptance is... Welcome to the family, dysfunction and all. It means we all have our issues. And, and celebrating people while they're on their spiritual journey. And so what that might look like, well, when, when my son was learning how to walk, when he was about six months old, I didn't get mad at him and start spanking him on the butt because he was trying to walk. I mean, that would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? Yes, no, yeah, it would be crazy. 
And yet sometimes in the church we do that to people that are newer in their faith. And we get mad at them because they, did, they wore a hat in service or they have whatever, whatever they do. We get mad at them for being different or they're still struggling with their smoking addiction or they're still cussing or they're still doing this or that. We're going to celebrate journey. We're going to walk alongside of people. Number three is that we agree with one another. Wait. Didn't you say that you don't have to agree to accept? Yes. But you also have to agree with one another. What does that mean? In First Corinthians, Dennis talked about this when he went through the series. You know, the church was arguing and bickering over who was the greatest pastor, who they were going to follow, and they were mad at each other, and they were treating each other with disrespect. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another. And what you say, there be no divisions among you. But the, you are perfectly united in mind and thought. In other words, Paul was saying, keep the main thing the main thing. Don't die on molehills. Celebrate what you agree on and stop bickering about what you don't agree on. Most of us in this room would agree that the only way through salvation is through Jesus Christ. Let's agree on that. Let's not argue about whether a person is wearing a hat in the room or whether someone has tattoos or whether someone cusses or, I mean, the list could go on forever. Spend our energy and our time Focusing on what we agree on. The enemy's number one, probably the number one thing that I see in, in culture is to get us bickering about stuff that doesn't matter. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to see people argue over stuff that is ridiculous when we could be spending our, our time and energy focusing on getting, I mean, we live on the I-5. It's the biggest place for sex trafficking in America. Why can't we get more upset about that than what someone wears at church? Let's focus our energy and our time together, reaching into broken lives and helping people out of addiction. Let's spend our time and our energy trying to reach the, the most vulnerable in our society, whether it's through foster care, whether it's through adoptions, whether it's through widows, whether it's through people that, that struggle with drug addiction, let's focus on reaching the lost. Let's focus on, on reaching people and being the Christ that we claim that we follow instead of arguing about petty stuff. Number four, how do we love one another? We encourage one another. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, rejoice, strive in full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Hebrews 3.13 says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. He's basically saying every single day, encourage one another. Put courage in someone so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hebrews 10.24, you get the drift? He wants us to encourage one another. And, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day appro approaching. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your, but only what is beneficial and uplifting to those who hear. We need to be people of encouragement. Number five, serve one another. He talked about this last week. It all comes down to there you are attitude. Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and while he was saying that, he said, I didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. 
I think it's really easy to understand when we, when we read the Bible and say, yeah, that's a good idea. It's harder in real life. Say, for example, you go over to your friend's house every single week. I love hanging out with Rick and Sherry because they usually buy my food. <laughs> I, I like hanging out with Rick and Sherry. And, uh, you know, imagine if I just went to their house every single Friday and I hung out with them and they bought food. What are we doing next Friday? <laughs> They bought food, they did the dishes, they hosted, they, they, they did everything for us every single week, two hours a week. And I didn't get up to help with the dishes. I didn't, get, I, did, I didn't say, hey, do you want us to bring anything? Or say if we went somewhere, I didn't offer to pay for gas. I mean, you'd kind of think I was a jerk, right? And yet we do that with the church all the time. We come two hours a week and we say, all right, teach me what I need to know. I want you to teach me. I want you to entertain me. I want you to say funny jokes. I want you to sing the right songs. I want you to do this. That is not the attitude of Jesus. He came to serve, not to be served. And I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand who Jesus is. And so that might look different for every person in this room. It might mean that, you know what, I like coffee, so I'm going to make coffee in the morning for people. It might be, I'm good with technology, so I'm going to put the words on the screen. It might be, I love music, so I'm going to play music. It might mean, I'm, I'm retired and I don't have that much to do, so I'm going to serve someone that is just trying to get by through the week, and I'm going, to, I'm going to come alongside and minister to their kids during service. It could mean anything. But we as a church need to come alongside of each other and serve one another. Number six, how do we love each other? We live in harmony with one another. And um, Dennis talked about this this week, but I've asked someone to help me out with this example. So, Braden, why don't you come up? I don't know if you guys know Braden, but he's legit. So Braden has been in our youth ministry since he was a wee little lad. And uh, he plays piano. He plays piano pretty well, actually. Why don't you play us a song, Braden? Show us what you got. Is that the Hobbit song? Really? We're going to talk afterwards. Why don't, you, why don't you keep playing it? Can you talk at the same time? What key are you in? D. I don't play piano. But I know enough music theory to know that D only has one black key, which is the F sharp. You're playing it wrong. Let me show you how to play it. What about second breakfast? That sound good? No. I was playing the right chord. I actually was in a different key. Some of you guys are like, what? That was actually a chord in another key. It was right in the key that I should have been playing, but he wasn't playing in that key. He was playing in D. So play it. Doesn't that sound amazing? I 
I don't know what key I was playing in, but it doesn't go with what he's playing, right? And even though it's a chord in another key, I'm not playing along with him. I am not playing in harmony with him. I'm not playing in coming alongside of him. So why don't you play? Why don't you play the melody? Do you know what the melody is? Frodo Baggins. Doesn't that sound, sound better than what I was playing? Why don't you add the harmony to it? Sounds a lot better, doesn't it? No? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Braden. Jeanette's still wondering why I told him to do that. Because she's very more, she's more musically talented than I am. And, and, and I'm, and I'm going I'm to say it here right now. Love does not demand its own way. It says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not demand its own way. It says that we are to live in harmony with one another. So even though I was playing a chord in the right, in my right key that I should have been playing, I was demanding my own way. And I was playing chords and I was pushing and I was pushing and I was pushing. What does it sound like as a church if we demand our own way to people that are trying to listen to the music? If a person comes into this building on a Sunday morning, doesn't know who Jesus is, and all they hear is gossip. Well, this person, this, 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 they didn't do what I wanted them to do. And they're, they're going to hear it from me. They're going to do what I want them to do. What does it look like in our marriages when we demand our own way on the outside? If we live in harmony with one another, we support one another. We support the melody. Paul says it in a different way, that we are, we are Christ's body. Some of us are hands. Some of us are feet. Some of us are the mouthpieces of God. And we all have a different role to play. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are prophets. Some of us are apostles. And if we focus on what other people are not doing, rather than playing the keys that we're supposed to play, it sounds a lot like that. Give you an example. There's... there's and what I've seen in, in, in life. Someone says, well, we just need to reach everyone. We need to be outside the church. We need to be outside the four walls. And we need to be preaching the gospel. Yes, that is true. And there's other people that say, we need to train people when they come to Jesus about how to live a right life and how to honor God in our life. And the people that are outside of the four walls saying that we need to preach are getting mad at the people for not coming outside of the church. But we need both, right? We need to reach the lost, but we also need to train people and equip them for life. I'm going to invite my wife up to, to come and end us. So number one was we greet another with a holy kiss. We're, hospital, we're, we're hospitable. We welcome one another. We welcome them into our family. Number two is we accept one another. Number three is we agree with one another. We focus on the things that are the most important. Number four, we encourage one another. Number five, we serve one another. And number six, we live in harmony with one another. And while she's singing this song, I'm just going to put the, the things that we've been talking about for the past two weeks. So Dennis is in mine as well. And as she's playing this song, I just want you to have a, a moment of self-reflection. And say, where am I lacking in love? Daniel, can you go to the last slide? So am I welcoming people into the family? Am I, am I creating a hospital 
this hospitable environment? Am I accepting people for where they're at? Am I welcoming, welcoming them in this journey? Am I focused on what I agree? Or am I trying to argue with them? Am I trying to argue with them? Do I lack in love when it comes to serving someone else? Do I demand my own way or do I come and support the melody? Do I support what's going on? Do I need to stop passing judgment on one another? Do I need to stop talking about people in the church? Do I need to stop grumbling? I want you to, as she sings this song, I just want you to maybe focus on the screen or, or just close your eyes and ask yourself, where do I lack in love? So after she sings this the first time around, I'd like to invite, actually, if you guys want to come now, I'd like to invite the, the youth staff and the elders and the pastoral team. So if you guys could come up here, if you could go back in the, in the back for prayer, if some of you guys could go in the balcony. The Bible says in James chapter 5 that if we confess our sin to one another, that we may be healed. You know what sin is? It's, it's lack of proper love. And I'd like to encourage you, if, if any of these, and it might not even be in the church, you might have had an argument with your spouse on the way here. She's a part of the church too. And you might need to say, you know what? I haven't been as encouraging to you as I should have been lately. Or it could be your son. I've been too hard on you. And I haven't been an encourager. Or it might be to one of the pastors. I've been grumbling against you. It might be, you know what? I need to find a place to serve. And if we confess to one another, it brings us into accountability with one another. And it also, if we're, if we're holding things inside of our hearts, the sins inside our hearts and we just need to, to give them up, it brings healing. So I want you to, I, I want to encourage you to, as she sings this song, if, if you know what it is that you struggle with and, and the things that you're lacking in love, I would love for you guys, I know it's something we've never done before, but I would love for you to come up to these pastors and elders and say, you know what? I need to apologize. I need to apologize for this. I need to apologize for that. And they're just going to pray with you. Is that okay? All right, why don't you guys stand with us? We're going to sing this song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the staff and the pastors to, to stay up here. But I just want to close in prayer. And if you guys want to come up here afterwards, and, and this was too, a, too of an uncomfortable moment for you, and you just want prayer, I just want to encourage you to come up here afterwards. But we're going to close and we're going to dismiss. So, Father, we pray, Lord, that we would build our life upon who you are. God, we would build our life upon your love, Lord that we would live like you do. God, I pray that today that you would, you would put that song in our heart, that we would, we would want to build our lives, God, on how you see people and how you give grace and how you give mercy. Lord, and I pray that we would walk that out this week. And everyone said, amen. Thanks for coming, guys.